Okay, in this I want to cover how to actually automate the rockets so that you can send them off, get them to the planets, come come back, unload, and then immediately take off again without any interaction from yourself. So what we have here is the automation overlay for the command capture. Now you'll notice here there's two, well, two possible input slash outputs. This is actually the output signal. This output signal will by default be red, but will turn green when all of these are ticked off, as in fuel tanks are full, uh, well, fuel tanks are, t are present, emptied cargo bay, has an atmosuit, has an astronaut, and has a destination. So long as all those are ticked off, it will output a green signal on this line. So when this lands at first, it will not have empty cargo bay, so this will output a red signal. Once the cargo bays are empty, a green signal will be output. Now, uh, don't worry too much about this. This is not actually that complicated, really. It's more a case if we just want to take this green go signal, and we want to send that signal to the doors, so that the doors open, and we want to send it back into the command capsule. This is the input. If you send a green signal in here, the rocket will attempt to launch. Now, when I say attempt to launch, there's a few things that can stop it. Uh, well, one thing mainly, and that is if the path is blocked. If the path in front of it is blocked, and that will be blocked if the doors up above it are closed. If the doors above it are closed, it can't launch. So what you could do is just have the green signal input directly into this and it will immediately launch the rocket the moment it's available. What we are doing in this case is we are sending this into a buffer gate or a filter gate which is going to stall the signal for 40 seconds before we then send it down here uh, to tell the rocket to launch. And there's a reason for that which we'll cover when this comes back. Uh, now I've thrown it into an AND gate and I've hooked that up to a pressure sensor. The reason being I want to if the rocket's away and I want to stop it and tell it not to launch again, I can simply set this to off like I've done here, and this way it won't relaunch. That's also hooked back up here to this AND gate. When uh, the green signal comes out of here to launch, it sends a signal, assuming this says yes as well, it sends a signal up to the doors telling the doors to open. So let's just uh, give this a quick flick. All right. Now, that sends a green signal up to the doors. Now, as you'll notice, there's actually a green signal being sent to the launch, but it hasn't started launching yet. That's because, if you look at it here, it says launch path is blocked. Until the doors are completely open, it won't launch. And there we go. Now, this space scanner is set to detect the cargo. The reason it's set to the, uh, this is the name of the ship I'm, I've just launched. It's called a cargo short. This is a short distance cargo hauler. This is connected right back up to the gates as well, and that's connected through an OR gate. If either the spaceship or the scanner say open, tell, sends a signal to open the doors, they will open. When the ship comes back in range, this will detect it, and when it detects it coming back in for landing, it will send a, an activation signal to the gates to tell them to open. And that's pretty much it. The next part is automated cargo unloading. Okay, the scanner has detected that the cargo ship is returning and it actually starts to open the doors. Now there is still a bug with the doors here, they're called uh, oh, was it Schrodinger's doors. If, you, if doors start to open while you're off screen and then you move the camera over to look at them, the doors will reset back to their fully closed position and start to open from scratch. So if you get a notification that a rocket is landing, don't immediately go and look. Wait until after the rocket has landed before you go look. Otherwise, you'll reset the doors and cause yourself problems. Secondly, yes, you will end up opening the doors during meteor showers. Nothing you can do about it. So you're going to have to make your uh, rocket launch area pretty robust. Just to, just to ensure that nothing gets damaged. Now, the rocket here is going to land. Look at the overlay, it's showing red, everything is showing red, and now let's check out the cargo wagon. Now I have a couple of automation rails, shipping rails set up here. And they're just moving the cargo out of the cargo base. So if we look down here, you can see it slowly pulling everything out. This is going off to a, all of this is heading off to a loading area where I'm actually storing all of this. I, I set up a specialized unloading area where I actually store everything that's going out. Also, as well as that, it's currently being re refueled, and it's just about ready to go again. Now, one thing here. You'll notice that this cargo bay is empty, and the doors have just about closed. What can happen is if you unload the ship too quickly, for example, I here am compressing them both onto a single rail. This slows down the unloading of the ship. 
uh, if you use two rails, there is a chance you can unload the ship so fast that it will actually be unloaded before these doors finish closing. If that happens, the ship will then immediately try to launch again. Because, because all the cargo is gone, it will be sending out a green signal, and because the doors haven't completed their closing animation, they're technically classified as open. And because they're still technically classified as open, the rocket will try to launch through the doors that are partially closed. And then it will confetti your partially closed doors. This is the whole reason we have this actual uh, filter gate here. Uh, I set it to 40 seconds just to ensure that it cannot launch and go through the doors. If you're just uh, siphoning everything down a single cargo rail, you should be fine. That should never become an issue. So you could probably get rid of the filter gate at that point. I just left that in because I encountered problems at the start when I was uh, unloading these manually myself. If you unload manually, you'll immediately try and launch and go through the doors. I would definitely recommend keeping the filter gate in place. Now, once the second cargo wagon is unloaded, the on signal is sent. Now you notice here this uh, on signal immediately bypasses this buffer gate or the filter gate to go straight up to open the doors. That ensures that the doors start to open immediately. The doors will take mm, 38.2 seconds, I believe. So they'll be open uh, for about two seconds before the rocket will eventually decide to trigger. And there we go. and launch. And that's an automated way to make sure that you can actually obtain resources from planets without any interaction from yourself. The doors will automatically close themselves. All the resources are being shipped down here and I'm sending them over to a cargo unloading area where I'm storing everything for long-term storage. This just ensures that I won't get any backlogs. I want to make sure that the system keeps running clean. Now, what planets are you actually going to want to harvest resources from. It's quite simple. The first one is going to be the ice planet. You're going to want to go there a few times just to get wart seeds. These warts are very useful. They're a free form of cooling, infinitely renewable form of cooling. So yeah, you're going to be heading here. You'll get about, you'll have to send biological cargo bays to pick up these resources. They weigh the exact same as regular cargo bays. So the rocket calculator will basically just put in two regular cargo bays, but send two uh, biologicals. The math is all the same, the maths. Now, um, after you've done about four or five trips there, that's probably all you're going to need, unless you really, really want lots of wart seeds. You're probably never going to go back there again. There's nothing worthwhile. Uh, after that, you're looking for nobidium, thermium, and isoresin. So basically, whatever planet is the closest. Uh, you might find something like this, where nobidium, uh, nobidium here is 3%. This is 4 This is 4 So this 4% planet is really close, has a short turnaround, and will give me lots of resources. Even if this planet had 8%, it's twice as far. Uh, it's three days, uh, add three days for each ring. So it's three, six, nine, 12. That's how long the return trip will take uh, all the way out to the ends. So normally you're better off getting all your rare resources from the close by planets. The second ones you're going to want to look at are the satellites. This is the satellite ring. Actually, I should mention there will always be two carbon asteroids. There will always be one metallic asteroid. And in the third ring, there will always be one satellite and one rocky asteroid, minimum. These ones actually, this is where it gets a little bit interesting. These are, that's what the minimum of what you will have. And then you can have up to two extra celestial bodies. And those ones will always be, if there are any extra ones, they will always be satellites, it seems. Uh, in the fourth ring, you will always have an ice planet and then up to three other bodies, but it can be on its own. In the fifth ring, you will always have an organic mass and then up to three more planetary bodies. The planetary bodies will, all, will be made up of anything you've encountered before, except for satellites. Satellites only appear in this ring. Once you get beyond there, it gets even more random. I think dusty dwarfs start to appear about here, and then they can get added to the mix. But everything from about 60,000 kilometers out to 80,000 kilometers is just a random mix of these previous planetary types and dusty dwarves. Then at the 90,000 kilometer ring, you can start encountering terrestrial planets and volcanic planets. We don't really care about those. And then in the last two rings, you can encounter gas giants. So next up, satellites. You're going to want to probably do return cargo missions to satellites because they're the only ones that have steel. Uh, I have multiple ones to choose from, so I'll just pick whichever one has the best return, usually either nobidium, isoresin, or fullerene. This one's terrible, it's got a bisselet, but they'll get steel, copper, and glass. 
I would normally configure a return ship to go to there. Then after that, you don't care about any of these planets. Honestly, they're, they're not really worth it. Even the ones that contain water, like for example, if you send two liquid cargo containers here, you can come back with two tons of polluted water. However, you won't be able to get enough hydrogen to pay for itself. You won't be able to get enough water to pay for itself. It's just not actually worth the effort of going to those planets. Uh, gassy moo and the gas grass seed are marginal use. At this point, your power needs should be obliviated already. However, gas giants are an interesting, interesting planetary type. They contain two things by default, natural gas and hydrogen, both in gaseous form, and you need to send a gas car canister to collect them. However, they also have the possibility of having those uh, hidden elements, and they are always solids. So if I sent two cargo containers out here, I will get 100% abyssalite, which is kind of use useless. But over here, you'll notice this one has isoresin and fullerene meaning if I'm willing to make the 33 day round trip, I can obtain almost two tons of isoresin and quite a bit of uh, fullerene. Here is one cargo ship I sent out and it came back with 976 kilos of isoresin and 23 kilos of fullerene. And there's two of those cargo wagons. So the planets you really want to get into are scout the gas giants. They might be useless, they might be something like this and you get absolutely nothing out of it. But if you can find a good one, they can definitely completely remove a need. They could, that's my entire source of ice resin now. I don't need to send any ships to any other planets. But barring the gas giants, you're pretty much stuck inside these three rings here. That's it. Whatever the closest source of nobidium, ice resin, and fullerene are, that's all you're going to be sending repeat missions to. And with that in mind, what's the point of researching these planets then? Because I am going to research every single one of these. Well, every time you tick off these, uh, these boxes here, you have a a small chance of acquiring a neural vacillator recharge. Uh, there it is, a vacillator recharge. What these allow you to do is, where's my one, it's over here. Ah uh, yes, you can actually recharge these neural vacillators and they give you four possible outcomes. Now, if we'll just go grab, where's Brains? I was unlucky with him. Now, let's go to the bottom. The first one you can, well, there's four of them you can get and you get one of them at random. You get sunny disposition, minus 20% to stress the cycle for the duplicant. Not really worth it. A rock Crusher, plus 10 strength, or plus 400 to kilos to carry capacity, which is probably the second most useful. Regenerative, plus 20 to health the cycle. Not really useful unless you keep sending your duplicant into volcanoes to mop up magma. Borderline usefulness. But the last one, the most important one, is deeper diver's lung. It halves the oxygen consumption of that duplicant. That's quite, quite useful. If you can get nine or 10 of your duplicates on that, or say 10 of your duplicates on that, they effectively become five duplicates for op oxygen consumption purposes. This also stacks with diver's lung. So if they already have diver's lung, it will reduce their oxygen consumption from 100 grams to 25 grams, making them a quarter of a duplicate. Okay, a note on insulation. Insulation is incredibly useful for dealing with liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. However, it requires reed fiber, five units of reed fiber per craft. So to make one single pipe, uh, one single insulated pipe made of insulation requires 400 kilos. So that requires four crafts of insulation. That requires 20 units of reed fiber. Reed fiber you can grow yourself. And unfortunately I've kind of annihilated most of the reed fiber on this map, the wild growing stuff. Do not do that. Keep the reed fiber alive you want lots and lots of reed fiber because to actually grow it in hydroponics is insanely expensive. Uh, the problem being you need 20 units of reed fiber. To grow that reed fiber, it will cost you 160 kilos of polluted water a cycle, and it takes two cycles, so 320 kilos. Uh, effectively to make one insulated pipe out of insulation, if you have to grow the reed fiber yourself, will cost you 6.4 tons of polluted water, or 6.4 tiles of polluted water to make one insulated pipe out of insulation. Keep the reed fiber on your map alive and stockpile hundreds if not thousands of the reed fiber for when you actually gain access to space. Uh, at the moment I'm trying to do the, the maths on how I'm going to, to produce enough of it to do anything useful. One problem you're going to face is if your rocket attempts to land during a meteor shower, the scanners quality will be degraded because what will happen is all of your other doors will close all of your scanners I have active scanners over here uh, let's see 
yeah, I have scanners here that are feeding my solar panels. But when the door is closed during a meter shower, those scanners stop feeding into the network, which reduces capacity. So what I've done is I have left a space scanner naked out in the open. This space scanner's only purpose is to help increase my odds of catching rockets on their return journey before they smash right into my doors. Now, the odds of them smashing into the doors are not absolutely horrible, but they're not good. Uh, with no with no other with no scanners actually available to look at the sky, your chances of detecting it will be between one to two hundred seconds before they arrive, or zero to two hundred seconds, I should say. Basically, you have about a seventeen and a half percent chance that if a rocket tries to land during a meteor shower, he'll smash right into the doors and shred them. I have confettied several doors. Now, what I have done is I've left this scanner out in the open and I've just kept these mining drills here to actually keep the area and its scanning radius clear of debris so it will always have full scanner quality. Now that said, during a meteor shower, the meteors themselves will interfere with the scanner and degrade its service on and off. However, this has definitely increased the odds of me catching the rockets in time and making sure the doors open. But it's not perfect. You will still have the odd occasion where a rocket will return and it will smash straight through the bunker doors, but the percentages should be reduced by to about hopefully one or two percent. I need to run this long term to be sure. Unfortunately, my game is starting to get a little bit unstable because of the, the size of the base and all the uh, run, little bits and bobs I have running. So I would have liked to test this longer to be 100 percent certain, but I can't be sure this game will remain stable much longer. So I'm trying to get this finished. But uh, yeah, my advice Build yourself one of these if you want to ensure that you ne that you reduce the amount of smash doors you end up with. And don't go looking at the doors when you get that alert, oh, there's a rocket landing. Wait until after it's landed before you go look. You don't want to cause a Schrodinger's door incident. Uh, also, this is made of iron, I should point out. Uh, I made this out of iron because iron literally falls out of the sky. So when this does get damaged by meteors, there's usually a bunch of nearby iron that my duplicates can use to repair it, making it a, a cheap and sustainable way of keeping this operational. Now, when it comes to rocket refueling, there is uh, a couple of things you need to be aware of. There's a, currently a bug. Uh, it should be fixed soon, hopefully. When uh, uh, After you load up your game you and the rocket lands, the, this resets the, the storage capacity. As in, the game seems to lose track that this is locked down to something lower than it currently is. So what will happen is I have set this to 2,143 kilos. However, if I reload the game, this will be lost and it will try to load this up to the maximum capacity. To counteract this, all you have to do is just go into into the, the actual fuel tank itself, select the letters and just hit enter and that will reset it for you. Well, that will reset it. However, that, that that's kind of annoying if your rocket lands, you come back up to check on it to go relaunch it and you realize you've crammed all the cargo tanks full of fuel and you don't need to use that much fuel for the destination you're going to. Now you can unload fuel, uh, that's what these uh, gantries are for. However, it's of course a waste of oxygen, liquid oxygen and hydrogen, which you can't really get back into that system. So try and avoid it if possible. And when it comes to gantries, uh, there's many ways you can automate these things, but the simplest thing is just hook up a pressure sensor directly to them. Uh, the problem is they draw 1.2 kilowatts, so if you try and hook them all up to one pressure sensor and activate them all at once, you're going to overload the wire. Uh, I usually just stick on one, leave it at that. And then whenever uh, something overfills or I need to do some maintenance or rip something out, it's simply a case of turning on the ones I need. Now, one last thing about the refueling. I've made some minor modifications here. Uh, it's still the same loop system going on, but what I've done is I've ran them beside or just above the uh, actual fill ports. And then what I do is I run a one piece of actually insulated pipe made of insulation into the into the cargo wagon. What happens here is if uh, I've just loaded the game and I've come back and I want to make sure that the rocket that's going to be back in seven cycles doesn't refill when it comes back, I just delete these segment, these uh, pipes here. It won't affect the system and I can let the liquids flow through for the rest of the rockets that I have already reset. But hopefully that should be patched out and you won't need to do that in the future. Uh, having watched playthroughs by other people, I presumed I would only need about three astronauts. However, that is not the case. Uh, I currently am desperate for more astronauts. I, I could definitely be launching two, if not three more rockets regularly. The only problem is I don't have the personnel to do it. Uh, 
all of these duplicants are perfectly trained up and could be moved in, but I don't want to waste them. They are trained up in other areas that makes them very useful, and I don't want to I don't want to waste their talents by sending them into space. My advice: plan ahead. If you're going to be dedicating one kilo of oxygen to your rocketry program, you're probably going to need about five astronauts. It is a way to sustainably mine space for large quantities of steel, diamond, uh, pretty m uh, and all the other space materials you need. And it can be completely automated to the point where you don't even have to interact with it. It's, it's effectively trading water for minerals that you may find useful. Uh, an interesting side note on hydrogen rockets, they emit steam on takeoff. Uh, they will keep emitting steam uh, on the launch animation up to about this point here. And all that steam can actually be condensed. Well, assuming you have a ridiculous cooling solution. And it emits about 1,850 kilos of water. Sometimes a little bit less, uh, sometimes about 1,810 is about the lowest I've seen it go. Now, it, the amount of steam it emits is regardless of destination and regardless of how much fuel you have in it. So it doesn't matter where you send it, it will always give off the exact same amount of steam. It gives off about 700, uh, about 750 kilos on launch and then about another 1,050 kilos on landing. If you could find some sort of ridiculous solution to condense it all, that amount of water would allow you to send one hydrogen rocket with one cargo module to the closest planet, uh, and the amount of water you actually get out of it on the launch and landing would actually pay for the cost of sending the rocket indefinitely, and would produce an, a, about over 700 grams of excess oxygen. So. I don't know if it's viable, considering the enormous amount of heat produced, but it can actually be done. Also, rockets can't get flooded. You can literally fill the entire rocket chamber with liquid, and the rocket will still launch just fine. A few side notes if you're looking for uh, some sort of interesting project to take on in the endgame. In the description, you're going to find a couple of links. One to this save game. This is the test map I was running just to test and test builds before I implemented them on my real map. And I will also include the actual live playthrough I'm doing as well. A note on the live playthrough, it takes a long time to load. That uh, that's got, map's gotten quite big, and it has started giving me the odd crash now and then as well. So just, just be aware that if you do load it up, it'll take a minute or three. So with all that covered, I think we've got all the major mechanics that you, you need to get from early game to late game. We didn't include some of the things which I didn't think were too relevant or too important towards getting you to this point. At this point, you should have access to all the tools in the toolbox, and you can play around to your heart's content. Now, I'm going to have one more tutorial after this, and it's just going to cover, well, basically a tidy up. It'll be a hodgepodge of random things that I didn't get to include in the previous ones. Regolith removal, shovel vol farming, lots of random stuff. Once all of that is uh, out of the way, we should, be, uh, we should be done. So if you have any questions that you'd like answered before then, just put them in the comments, and I'll try and get around to including them in the next video. Yeah. Uh, as always, give the designs a try yourself. Maybe redesign them. Maybe you can come up with something more efficient or faster or better. There's always ways to improve upon just about anything.